Uh, but presentation style, there is, there's nothing similar to Andrew Womack's presentation style, which I have many people say and have heard that when they first started listening to Andrew Womack, he put them to sleep. And, but uh, Norval won't put you to sleep uh, in any way, shape, or form. And so, so some of you, this will be your first exposure, and he, he may irritate you. He may, uh, and I do want you to know there's a side of Norval when he came to the conclusion that the way he was living his life, a very successful businessman, I don't think, I think he had 10, between 10 and 14 businesses, and most of them were over million dollar businesses. Uh, he came to the conclusion he just wasn't, that that wasn't the way life was supposed to be just that, making money, and um, he felt like the Lord was pulling on him, the Lord was nudging him, the Lord was doing something with him, and uh, he went to, uh, the for some reason, he went to the city dump in the area, I think Cleveland, where he lived, and he was uh, approached by a little girl who must have fished out, uh, uh, this was years and years ago, so it was when you had glass bottles that were milk bottles, and she must have had a quart bottle or what looked like a quart bottle of milk. I guess that she had gotten out of the garbage. And it had just a little bit of milk in the bottom of it, at least how they represented it, the representation. that He was on Sid Roth, uh, I think, four or five years ago. And they did a dramatization of it. And that's, that's what the dramatization was. And he felt like God just tore his heart wide open uh, with compassion for this little girl and he's, he said, uh, Lord, I think what you're doing is you're telling me this is my ministry, the city dump. And so for seven years, that was his ministry, ministering to the people at the dump, the people that came, people he encountered there. Um, and at the, at the end of seven years, he felt like the Lord told him, in essence, I've been testing your heart. And you've passed the test. Now I want you to be a teacher. So I have great respect for that beginning. Norval, uh, I think I'm like, more like Andrew Womack than uh, Norval Hayes. So what I've done is I've brought an old friend with me to begin and to end with, and we'll let his animation be the animation. Now, so the fir this first is four minutes. It's introduct this is an introduction to uh, what who Faye and I call normal Norval, made back in 1985. And uh, so I think the second slide that I have... Um, is call those things that be not as though they were. That's the title of this. This was extracted out of one of his many, many, many teachings that you can find on YouTube. And um, it's just about a four-minute testimony. And um, th this, for some of you, this will be over the edge. And for some of you, uh, it will be very attractive. For some of you, it could be very offensive. Um, and uh, my opinion is that's normal. And uh, in the second uh, video, much longer, that I'll show at the end or for the conclusion, you'll come to understand, if you don't know, why he approaches life and ministry and healing, why he do because of what took place in his own life, in his own daughter, in his own home. But that's the end of the story. This is kind of the beginning. So I want to start with call those things that be not as though they were. It's like a four-minute testimony. Uh, largely, I'm doing this to introduce you to Norval Hayes. Please. He's 91 now, and um, I'm sure he's still they were. ministering. Yeah, in Canada, in a church, one Sunday afternoon. I never will forget it. They didn't have any air conditioning. I was sweating then more than I am now under these lights. I was wringing wet with sweat. I never will forget that afternoon. And they pushed they pushed a man with a wheelchair down there. About 40 or 50 people came to the altar. And a man with a wheelchair came down. His legs was twisted. And crooked, you tell he'd been crippled for 20 or 30 years. He'd been that way for years. You can just tell it. And the Lord said to me, Son, what you taught today would work for him if he would obey it. I said, Glory to God. I said, Sir, I taught, call those things that be not as though they were. And the Lord just said to me that what I taught today would work for you if you'd obey it. Now, look at your crooked legs and call them straight. He goes, What? I said, Didn't you hear me for the last hour, hour and a half? He said, Yeah. I says, Well, obey what I taught. He goes, 
Why should I talk, call those things that be not as though they were? God said, it worked for you. Call your crooked legs straight. Look at them and call them straight. Uh, he goes, uh, and he wouldn't do it. He just wouldn't do it. I says, well, I'm just, God told me to work for me if he did it. So I think I'll just, I think I'll just demolish his mind. <laughs> Most people's minds needs to be totally demolished. And so I grabbed a hold of the banister of the church like this, and I knelt down to, I put my mouth close to his ear, and I said, Call your crooked legs straight, 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 call your crooked legs straight. Sir, call your crooked legs straight, call your crooked legs straight. And I kept on and on and on. And the longer I went, the louder I got. Call your crooked legs. And finally, I blasted through his goofy mind. <laughs> oh. Well, that's not easy to do with most humans, you know, especially if you've been trained one way for years. And they, I said, call your crooked legs straight. And finally he looked at him and he says, uh, uh, I call my crooked legs straight. I said, say it again. I call my crooked legs straight. I, I, I call the crooked legs straight. I, I call the crooked legs straight. I, I call the crooked legs straight. I says, keep on. And he said, I call the crooked legs straight. I said, thank God. I'm about out of breath. <laughs> He said, I said, keep on now, keep on. Don't stop. Sir, don't stop. I began to back away from him. Don't stop. Don't stop. Keep on and on and on and on. Don't stop. Don't stop. Keep on and on. Don't stop. And he sat there, I guess, for about five minutes. And I was ministering to other people over here. I looked around there, and the Spirit of God was all over him. Just, I mean, he was totally saturated, and he had broken, and began to cry and weep, and he was saying, I call my crooked legs straight. I call my crooked legs straight. I call the crooked legs straight. I call the crooked legs straight. I call the crooked legs straight. I said, keep on, keep on. And he kept on and on, and just being saturated by the power of God. And uh, all of a sudden, he just... Uh, Went across the floor. The pastor went. <laughs> the pastor said he ain't never done anything like that before. And I said he never sit there and call his crooked leg straight before either. Romans 4, 17 says, Call those things and be not as though they were. I, I spent time, when I found that one, I spent time reading just a few of the comments, um, the responses that people make, like on YouTube. And I think the second one that I read, the person said, This is what is wrong with those people who believe in faith. He said, you quoted, as he did here, Romans chapter 4, that God calls those things that be not as though they were. And the, the person's comment was, quoted that, that verse, God is the one who calls those things that be not as though they were. We are not supposed to do that. These faith people are wrong. That was the comment. I decided I'm not going to read any further. The point being, you can look at the Bible like the Bible is to, it's a, it's a, a history book, and it explains to us what took place and how God did things, but has absolutely nothing to do with how we should be living our lives, so to speak, and uh, how we should approach life, how we should do what we go about doing. That what the value of the Bible is to appreciate what God did and how Jesus ministered when he was here. But uh, the implication, to me, the clear implication, it doesn't amount to anything as far as how I approach my life in terms of how Jesus lived his life. And I believe just the opposite. I believe Jesus was the teacher. And his point was for us, he showed us how we're to live life. And he, uh, when he rose from the dead and went into the upper room, he said to his disciples, as I have been sent, so I am sending you. Just like I was sent. And the whole basis of Jesus' ministry was he made it crystal clear he had been sent by the Father and he humbled himself completely from the position that he was in and gave it all, in essence, up to do, accomplish his Father's will and he was a sent one. 
And then when he met with his disciples who were afraid and scared in the upper room, understandably, thinking maybe they were going to be next to be put nailed to a cross, when he came into the room, walked through the whatever he did, the walls, the door, and as I have been sent, I am sending you. So using that as a bit of a backdrop, when I went on vacation, I, there were vacation musings and experiences. What was pleasing to me, because all of this in my mind is connected together. What was pleasing to me? I decided before I went, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, especially because we at New Covenant are approaching an incredibly significant 12-year mark. At least to me, that 12 years ago, 2006, uh, the Ukraine trip, the four movies that I spent uh, almost two months watching after I came back from Ukraine because of the year and a half, in essence, that I devoted myself to learning video editing and to doing documentary documentaries, and Gary Beaton and I essentially worked uh, kind of night and day, kind of, for six months prior to that Ukraine trip. I was worn out. Um, and the Ukraine trip, I was just so amazed. I remember asking over and over and over, how did this happen? How did we end up here? How did we end up making these documentaries and having 1,100 pastors here who now from every nation of the former Soviet Union, and they all had in their hands a free copy of these five documentaries, both in English and in Russian, full Russian, full English. I remember I over and over just marveled, how did this happen? And when we were riding from Kiev, Ukraine, down to the village, Faye and I were on uh, the same team along with Dolly Sauls and Kathy Fisher. That was our small team of four. We divided our group of 12 into four, four, three fours. And uh, I told several weeks ago as we were going, I'd never met Dan Slade, our driver, uh, knew he was a missionary, knew he had been at Toronto, somehow, some connection. And on the way, he explained, as I said several Sundays now, more maybe six or seven Sundays ago, that he said, actually, I was at the very first meeting that caused almost all of us in the car who had a sensing of first fruits and how important first fruits are. And that's what we are, of first fruits, uh, from the beginning, uh, the first day that the Induction notices for the end time army of God, according to Hudson, uh, no, according to Bob Jones, was November 1st, 1981. That was the first day they were to be mailed out when stamps went to 20 cents. And we have been first, not knowing it, took almost 15 years to come to realize it. We're very first fruits people. We came back from Ukraine. And I said over and over, uh, when Dan Slade, he was... He said he was actually the first one. He was at the first meeting, and he was the first person prayed for. I remember, I, I couldn't believe, you were the first of the first fruits? And here we are, we're in Ukraine together. We're delivering uh, sort of under your auspices or your missionary ship. I don't even know if that's a word, but under your missionary ship, we're here. And that's, and in my mind, that was a picture, that was a type, that was a shadow of what, the, the, the first one, and he almost immediately went to Ukraine, that uh, it said to me, okay, God, you were saying by how you worked those circumstances that what that anointing was unto was unto the harvest uh, and the, the end of the age harvest uh, that was going to start in Ukraine, at least according to Bob Jones, it was going to start in Ukraine. And it was like I kept saying over and over, how did we get here? How did we get here? I had the wrong answer. My answer was uh, a whole lot of services, uh, a few spectacular services, many just sort of average, and a few really awful services. But it was many years of many services in many churches in the United States and in Russia. That's how it happened. It was the wrong answer. All that happened because there was a call and an assignment that was on our lives, and we stayed available to the Lord. Now, I, I'm sure we caused him all kinds of headaches by all of the uh, maneuverings we did in coming in and out of the path that he had for us, but we were still enough available to him that uh, we could continue to function and flood, in essence, we flooded the former Soviet Union 
with five documentaries in Russian, in English, that talk about the prophetic call on Russian-speaking people, emphasizing that the last great uh, end-time revival is going to begin, or as Gwen Shaw wrote a little booklet, now deceased, now with the Lord, End Time Handmaidens, the light will come from Russia. That God used this church here in East Tennessee, small group of people, to flood the, 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 all of the nations of the former Soviet Union with the documentaries of, here's the calling that's on you, because God has chosen you. And the answer, why were we there? Because God had chosen us, and we kept ourselves available. So when we came back, the first thing that I did, I told Faye, I am so, I am so tired. What I'd like to do is just see a good video. And I saw four videos. I spent about six weeks. Uh, I spent a lot of time. And I, so there were four videos that I spent time uh, looking at. I started off with Miracle, about the 1980 hockey team that beat the Soviets that nobody said they could. It was absolutely impossible. I then went to a movie, Dreamer, that was not a true story, but it was a takeoff on a true horse that actually existed, Mariah Storm, that actually in her second year fell and broke. I had a spiral crack and a break in one of her legs and should have been put down. She wasn't, and the next year she won the Breeders' Cup as a three-year-old, a filly and was the only uh, up till then I don't know if it has changed since then there was never uh, a female uh, a filly uh, win the Breeders Cup uh, Cup and a year before she had a broken leg that should have put her down and uh, the next one was a golf movie I don't know why I watched it because uh, I, I'm not a golfer and it was the greatest game ever played and the last one was Glory Road so <clears throat> they they taught me God's calling, I believe, through those. About the third one, I came into Faye and said, I think God's going to ask us to do something that everybody who hears about it is going to say it's impossible. This is absolutely impossible. And she'd ask, well, what is it? I don't know. I don't have a clue. So there's, there's a whole lot to this story. I've told several of the pieces recently. and But one of the things was I decided on vacation, I'm going to take those four movies and I'm going to watch them again. Uh, they were so pleasing to me, and I did. Uh, and I noticed something in them. I hadn't ever noticed it before. I noticed that there was a significant failure or shortcoming uh, or coming short of, uh, like in the greatest, in the miracle, about 10 days before the U.S. hockey team played the Soviets in the Olympics, they played the Soviets in a demonstration game, a warm-up game, 10 days before the Olympics, and the Soviets beat them 10 to 3. And it was like, okay, that's our potential. That's what our team is going to do. They just were, in essence, demolished by the, the Soviet hockey team 10 days before the Olympics even took place. Uh, and the coach uh, who coached that, that team, Don, not Don, ha Don Haskins. No, not Don Haskins. He did the basketball can't remember his name. He was, uh, 12 years earlier, he was on the U.S. hockey team, and he got cut one week before the Olympics start. He was the last one that got cut so they could come down to the number. And so he had uh, a 12-year-old memory in him. He never even played in the Olympics. Now this was his chance to coach the team. Uh, he was a very successful college coach, having won the college, having won the whatever, the, the championship, NCAA championship, several years. And I watched them, and all of them, that was the characteristic. Tremendous, tremendous times where they came short. Either they failed or didn't make it in the greatest game ever played. Uh, Francis Wimo, uh, we met, who was the caddy who won the U.S. Open. Um, he tried out to play in the U.S. amateur contest first time that year and couldn't make the cut in the amateur and not many months later he won the US Open uh, in a stunning playoff uh, so that really caught my attention uh, that was very pleasing and encouraging to me it was incredibly encouraging uh, what was not pleasing to me as I listened to myself I didn't take our boat down there were some friends that we've met down there who used to schedule their week of vacation every year of the week we would come because we bring a bunch of teenagers with us and they wanted to be there because they loved all the antics that I made the teenagers go through 
troops. And so the little fields, they happen to be there. They're both police officers. That's a really funny story. Uh, but uh, they said, hey, you want to go skiing? Uh, so I said, sure. So he, he didn't know how to pull up a skier, and I wasn't sharp enough to tell him. And so he pulled the skier up just by kind of gradually increasing the speed. Now, you don't do that. No, you pop the skier up, right, and then, then you pull back. So uh, it's been several years since I skied, and the first time he tried it, uh, my legs started going this way, and I just let go. I knew I'm never getting up. Just, I'm not getting up. And why didn't I say to him, you've got to pop me up? I don't know. So the second time that he tried to pull me up, he started that same thing, slowly pulling out. This was this summer, and I felt in both legs, I felt something horrible in both legs. I won't show you the black and blue marks that still exist because it's not proper. Um, and I didn't say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I speak to you legs, you are healed in Jesus. I didn't say, I eventually said that after a passage of time. And as I evaluated, I thought, I didn't handle that very well. I didn't function as I want to function, as I want to be functioning. And I feel like I, uh, I suffered considerably. My legs are fine. Uh, I can get up and, up and down without any difficulty. At the same time, I'm still battling a lot of soreness. There were several events like that. There was a time that uh, Mr. Littlefield, police officer, he was telling me one of our conversations, he was telling me when he was shot at and how s somebody shot at him and shot his hand. And, uh, you, you know, how did that affect you? And uh, whatever they call that, post-traumatic syndrome or post-traumatic stress syndrome, whatever it is they call it, he's still been dealing with it. And he talked about how he's even affected to this day. And we had an opportunity. We, we were alone. We were standing on what's the boardwalk down there. And I'm looking at him, and I'm thinking, I need to pray for you. But I, and I didn't. I didn't. So I, as I've gone over those things in my mind, then and now I said, I am not where I want to be. Now, I've been at this nine months. Something's wrong. Uh, I'm very displeased. So you may be very displeased too, but at the same time, that's where it is, resolving the matter. So Faye and I were, were, were traveling home, and we were in Cleveland, and in Cleveland... Uh, she brings up the subject of Norval Hayes. Hey, this is where Norval Hayes is. I wonder if he's still alive. I wonder if he's still ministering. I don't know. And uh, Faye and her f iPhone, she's very adept at that iPhone, very adept. And I didn't know she was doing it, but she was looking up Norval Hayes, and she saw there was an online message for Norval Hayes. And so we got back in the car, and we had the 90 miles or whatever it was to come from uh, Cleveland, Tennessee to Knoxville, uh, the Monday that the Monday evening that we arrived home, and she asked, "Well, do you want to listen to Norval Hayes?" And I responded, "Sure." So it was like God was speaking to me, and I think, I think I have included in in that message, which is not what I played at the beginning. It's it's a much longer one. And I'll be playing in just a few minutes. Ha and he made this statement, have you been delivered from yourself yet? He was talking about himself, the journey, his own personal journey. He'll explain it just a little bit. But it was like that, have I been delivered? You know, what's the problem, Lord? What's wrong with me? H have I seen some things take place by following the principles uh, we've been looking at and what Andrew Womack and all the testimonies uh, and, and, and studying Jesus. Yes. Have I seen what I would call some s small victories? Yes. Have I seen any that I would call absolutely totally stunning? The closest thing is Faye's knee. Um, 
but there's lots of development that's still taking place in her knee and her muscles. Have you been delivered from yourself yet? Pride, I interpret that as pride. And I started on vacation, and when I came back, I've been listening to a, uh, another series by Andrew Womack. It's entitled Self-Centeredness, the Root of All Grief. And he defines self-centeredness as pride. I find myself in agreement. And that self-centeredness can be either how we exalt ourselves up or how we devalue ourselves down, or how little we think of ourselves or how insignificant we could be or how unimportant we are or how ungifted we are. That's self-centeredness. Who are we thinking about? Ourself. Or I'm wonderful, the world is waiting for me to step on the seam, seam, just you the far opposite end, uh, obviously uh, arrogance, that's self-centeredness, that's pride. It's all pride. How am I going to sound? What are people going to think? Because I've learned enough to know I can't pray for somebody any longer and say, let me pray for you and hope God does something. I just can't do that in good conscience. Because it's already been done. Everything that's been done, that can be done, is, that will be done, has been done. But in terms of the provision, Jesus has made it all possible. It's completely available. The delivery mechanisms, there are so many delivery mechanisms that God uses. But there's a fundamental dimension of Christianity, and that is walking in Christ as Christ. And that's been our point of focus. That's it. So um, I want to say this. In the message that I heard, I, I'm gonna ask, I've asked myself this question. How convinced are we that, quote, unquote, speaking to the mountain is really foundational Christianity? Is it fringe faith teaching? Is it foundational Christianity? Do we really believe it? tried to think of some examples. I can't think of any that really fit. So the one that I'm settled on, and it's got lots of flaws. When you walk into a room and all the lights are out, what do you do? You don't have to answer, but what do you do? You look for the light switch. Where do you look for the light switch? Uh, in most rooms, you look on the wall, either uh, j just to the left of the door, unless the door is in an unusual location, and then you'll look to the right. And uh, are, are you expecting the lights to come on? Are you expecting that to do something about the darkness that's in the room? The answer would be yes. Do you really believe that? I believe that everybody in this room really believes that. That you go into a room that's dark, you flip the light switch. Behind it is a, uh, a faith that there's an electric company and the bills are paid and there's electricity to the building, and the light bulbs, uh, the light bulbs are good. There's, there's lots of things that you take into a consideration, but do you believe that that is the way you answer or resolve the problem? There's not enough light in this room. You flip the light switch. I would say every one of us in this room, I think, would say a hearty yes. We believe that. So we can go into a building we've never been in before. We can go to a country we've never been before. Now, the, the, the more remote the country, the more you, there may be a pull chain. But we've learned uh, there may be a pull chain if it's old enough that you pull to get the lights on. But you throw the switch. And so my question is, is speaking to the mountain, is speaking, how fundamental? How fundamental of switch is it in Christianity? Or is it fringe? Is it just... I, you know, just it's just not, it, it, it's friend. How deeply do we believe it? It can be at the level where we believe, uh, yeah, I should be saying things, I should be making a good confession, I should be speaking to my legs or knees or eyes or ears or hair or whatever. I, I should be. And I've heard people do that many times and laugh about it, and I want to say, you don't really believe. I'm, I'm not trying to make you mad. I'm not trying to criticize you. I'm having my own struggles in dealing with disbelief and doubt. But if you think you're really believing, it's, well, this is supposed to work. This is the kind of thing you're supposed to do. You don't believe. We don't believe. We want to. We believe the Bible. It's, it's in the Bible. 
But do we believe it like, I had to come to the conclusion, I must not. Like I believe the light switch is the answer to bring light to the room. In some dimension, it's very similar in that the, um, the price, you know, ha is the electricity paid for? Yes, the electricity is paid for, hopefully in whatever home or business that you go to to flip the switch. The price has been paid. Jesus has paid the price. It's not a question of is the price paid. It is fully paid. And what appears to be the switch? It appears that our mouth is a fundamental switch. Are there times that God, he gives a gift of faith or he just, he, he just will interject what his intentions are? Of course. There are so many delivery systems as you, you know the story, you could almost tell me uh, that, you know, how long the statement took where God said to me, that's the girl I'm going to marry. It, that was not where I was going. I wasn't there. It wasn't, uh, I accepted it. And in essence, if that's the girl I'm going to marry, I'm going to get to know her. I, in essence, started saying it and acting on it. But I, I didn't initiate that in any way, shape, or form. And in reality, we can just act on and proclaim what has already been initiated and given to us in Christ and that the Bible makes it clear this is the promise, the provision of God. But how convinced are we? And my opinion is in watching myself, my behavior said I don't really believe it. I may be toying with it. I may be trying to discover it. Uh, I may be exercising myself in some dimension. But is it something that flows out of my heart and as much with my heart as you would connect to believing that you flip the light switch and the light will come on? You just believe it. You don't even doubt it. You don't even question it. And then if it doesn't come on, you've got a whole series of things. Well, maybe the fuse, maybe, 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 because it should. So that, that's my intention for this week and next week to begin to, to look at that and so I want to look again, at least begin, 7.18. So I'm going to begin um, with uh, not, not retelling the whole story, just going to one of the times where Jesus, there are not many of them, and I just want to point out one, one, one or two aspects of it, and then we'll get to see somebody who's really exciting, Norval Hayes, uh, it's absolutely delightful. Uh, healing the epileptic son. So I'm just jumping into the story. We've covered it. We've gone through the story. But this is one of the instances where Jesus made, that dec made one of the declarations about speaking to the mountain. So I'm using the Mark version. You, this, you're familiar with this, Mark 9, 22. And after he had thrown him, so the father had come. He had been up on the Mount of Transfiguration. He'd come down. There was this mob coming toward him, this father of the epileptic son. He had spoken to Jesus. And when he had thrown, he, the, he was explaining, uh, the father was, and when he has thrown him into the fire and into the water to destroy him, but if you, so here was the father's question, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Now, in the cycle of the individual people that Jesus healed, this is way down toward where he went from here is down to Jerusalem. And there was just six or seven or eight other healing of individuals. From this one, he goes straight to Jerusalem, heals the man blind born, who was born blind, and then the woman who had a back, bent, back, bent back 18 years, then the man with dropsy and the Pharisee, the ruler of the Pharisee's house, then he raised Lazarus from the dead, then he healed blind Bartimaeus and two other blind men on the road from uh, Jericho, and then the last thing he did was Malchus, the, uh, the servant of the high priest, when Peter cut his ear off. This is so there's about 26, there are 26 individual accounts where he ministered to a single person, a couple of people on a few occasions, but uh, just, just a couple of people where he was ministering to them. So this is at, this is, this is at the end. This, these are in his last months. If you can do anything, his and most of his works, his mighty works, remember we, where Jesus brought three uh, ruling judgments against Capernaum, against Bethsaida, and uh, there was one other, Chorazin, 
And those are all at the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. And uh, where I, at least I, I'm among those who believe the Mount of Transfiguration was up in that area above the Sea of Galilee. And, and Jesus had said earlier that most of his mighty works were done in that sort of triangle area. And it's because of how they didn't repent, how they didn't respond. So it's, it was a strange question for this man, if you can do anything, because of the, the, the multiple instances where he healed everybody that took place in that region, and the individuals that he healed in that region. Um, the centurion, he was in the Galilee region, uh, the centurion servant. And uh, Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, was in that region. And the woman with the issue of blood was in that region. There were so many of the stunning miracles that Jesus did. So his question, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. So he, in essence, directed his question, it's all you. You can choose, and if you have compassion, you can do that. You can do, choose to minister to help me in this situation and my epileptic son. No, but if you can do anything, there's such a record of the things Jesus had did in that area. Have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus answered, Jesus said to him, if you can believe. It was like he threw the ball right back or hit the ball right back into his court. If you can believe. So Jesus' answer was, there's a lot that's dependent on you. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. That interaction where it was so clear, the man wanted to all be on Jesus. And his response was, if you can believe, all things are possible. It continues. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I do believe. And there's dimensions, there's worlds of unbelief. Because he watched that, all that young son's life, thrown in the fire, thrown in the water. He watched it. All those epileptic seizures, he watched that. However old he was, probably a young teen. He saw all of those. In one sense, it's understandable why he said, I believe, help my unbelief. All the things that he has saw and heard, how long? Since a child, because Jesus asked him, how long has this been? Well, since a child. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. And the disciples, so I'm, I'm jumping, I've gone to the Matthew account of it. I'm jumping to just another point. In the math. And the disciples came to Jesus privately and said to him, why could we not cast it out? Why couldn't we do this? We tried to cast it out. And we talked about that in some detail or some time period when we covered that. And so Jesus said to them, he's speaking in private to his disciples after the boy was healed, raised up, uh, because of your unbelief. That's why you couldn't do it, because of for I say to you, and so he's now addressing them. He said, I'm saying to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. They were countering, why couldn't we do, why couldn't we do it? Why couldn't we help this boy? Why couldn't we deliver him? And his answer was, he put it back in their court. He put the ball in their court. He gave them the ball. Are you going to run with it? Are you just going to hold it? Are you going to put it on a shelf as a trophy? That's my Bible. It's, it's a trophy. It's a trophy thing that just kind of, sort of, sits on the shelf or sits in my bookcase. It's where I keep my Bible. Or is it the tool chest, so to speak? Is it the uh, inerrant de declaration and history of what God has done, what Jesus did? It's what history was. It, it was the inerrant declaration. But it's also a tool chest of the tools. And Jesus was speaking to his, to, his, to his disciples in this dramatic event. And he said, but I say to you, it was because of your unbelief you couldn't do it. I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say, if you have faith as a must, now to assent, we are to believe it with our heart, 
that in essence, the Bible teaches that the way of God, that he has created his created beings to function following the model, the person because of Jesus and his indwelling life in us. This is how we're supposed to approach. So that means is, so we encounter a difficult, are we to speak to it like we have authority and that authority is to be released out of our mouth and, but I don't want to sound foolish. I don't want to sound weird. Um, it, it, it may not come to pass. I don't want to look bad. Well, you're dealing with self-centeredness. As Norva will say, you have to get over yourself. And it will move if you will say to the mountain. So it's like he took this humongous, uh, let's go to the top, let's move a mountain. Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you, Matthew 7. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. It's one of the reasons why I hope you fasted, or you're still in your, or you just, you just ended your fast. I started mine late, so I'm still in mine. So I don't want to keep you extraordinarily late. So I want to show you now a much longer version of Norval Hayes, how he learned to speak to the mountain. Now, this will be normal. He'll be forthright. This was given in Dallas, Texas in 1983. Please. But tonight, let him see and understand that everything that you've provided for us through Christ Jesus, you've given it to the church. It's a gift, a total gift. They don't have to pay for it. It's already been paid for. Let them see that, Lord. Let this message tonight brand itself on the inside of them. That they'll know forever that can you turn it up just a little bit free. and we'll give you the praise we'll give you the glory for everything that's done in jesus name real quick i want you to turn with me please to the chapter 21 of the book of matthew chapter 21 of the book of matthew All right, when you turn down to Matthew 21, 21, I want you to look up here at me, the local audience, and all the way across America, I've got something to tell you. When my daughter had growths on her, and I prayed for three years, and I could not get them to, they would not move off of her body, I kept seeking God for the truth. And I sought God for the truth. The Bible says that People are made to prosper as long as they sought the Lord. As long as you seek God, you'll always prosper. If you don't know something, then seek God and find out the truth. And so I begin to seek God because I've been praying for a long time. Well, I mean, how would you like to have a child with 40-some ghosts on her body? And they've been on there for years. And they'd break open and they'd bleed and everything else. And she had the ugliest hands of anybody in high school. And I knew it'd take a miracle from God, but I didn't know how to get it. I kept praying and praying, and trying to pray and pray and pray. And I began to seek God for the truth. I, I saw real quick like, that my prayers was not working. And I began to seek God for the truth. I mean, I prayed for three, several, several years. I could have kept on praying for 10 more years and not have got that. She could have wound up having gross all over her. But I'm a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ and she lives in my house and she's my own daughter and I have a right to have a daughter that's normal. So I saw that my prayers wasn't working so I just understand when your prayers is not working always know this that Jesus has the answer. So I began to seek God for the answer. I want to know the truth. And after I sought God after I sought God for the answer for a long time several months one night I was walking through my living room when I got out of a service on Sunday night. And it was like I stepped into a white cloud. I just, I didn't know anything was going to happen to me special. I don't consider myself a special person more than any other Christian, believer. I didn't even know God did things like this. But of course the Bible says he does. Paul said, Paul said, 14 years ago, all of a sudden, the man of God, there he was. Just all of a sudden, there he was in paradise. All of a sudden, that same manifestation happened to me. I'm just walking across the living room like this. And just, I took a step, and all of a sudden, just all of a sudden, I begin, I begin to descend out of my body. And I begin to go up 
wherever God was. Paradise or heaven. Now, one time I got to go to heaven and see something, and see some things in heaven, but this time I didn't see anything. The only thing I knew that I, I was slipping out of my body and going into another world. And uh, when I got in the other world far enough, God began to talk to me. And God said to me, How long are you going to put up with those ghosts on your daughter's body? Boldly. It wasn't one of these things, you know, I love you, son. <laughs> and, you're, and you're praying right, son. Just stay faithful to me and keep on praying. And one of these days, I'll remove those ghosts from your daughter's body. One of these days, I'll make your child normal. One of these days, I'll make your deformed child normal. One of these days, I'll open up your blind eyes. One of these days, I'll stretch your crooked legs out. Just keep on praying and believing, you know, just keep on praying like you're praying, and I'll do it. No, he didn't say that to me at all in no uncertain terms. He said with a strong voice, I mean strong, he said, How long are you going to put up with those ghosts on your daughter's body? We could ask, ask, he could ask every cripple in the world, How long are you going to put up with those crooked legs? And you'd go just like I was. You'd probably be just as stupid as I was. I went, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. Besides that, I was scared for even being there. I was, I was really, I mean, God is so clean and so holy, you get close to Him and you just kind of flake out. A holy awe comes up on you like that, you know. And you say, oh, the fear of God was on me. For even being on Him talking to me. And me being out of my body, it's a strange feeling. <laughs> it's a strange feeling to have your body standing in your living room and you're somewhere else. <laughs> and I said, my, 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 I don't know, Lord. I mean, I don't know. What, what, what do you mean? What do you mean, Lord? Then I, I don't have them on me. I don't, what do you mean? That kind of talking and that kind of believing really goes over with God. <laughs> he plainly lets you know that you're a bigger flake than he thought you were. <laughs> I mean, at least God and Charlie thanks, I guess, that we believe him a little bit. But you start stum stammering around, you know, you don't know what to believe. You know what's going on. How long am I going to put up? I've been praying for years. And here somebody comes along and asks me, how long are you going to put up with that? I said, oh, God. You know, I've prayed so much now, my jaws are sore. <laughs> well, he said, if you'll, if you'll go curse those things in my name, they will die and disappear. If you'll believe and not doubt, just like the fig tree did when I cursed it, he gave me scripture. Talk to it. That's a mountain in your life. Talk to it. Tell it what you mean. Tell it what you want done. It'll obey you if you'll do it in my name. Curse the roots of those gross. They have no choice. They'll die and wither away and disappear. If you will believe and not doubt. And I said, yeah, 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 okay. All right. Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. <laughs> Why not? I've tried everything else. And when I began to slip back into my body, I mean, I went in where she was at and I cursed those dumb things in Jesus' name and cursed the roots of them. And about 40 days later, I kept on believing and I refused to doubt. I kept on believing. And God's power moved in her room one afternoon when she came in from high school. They'd been on there for years and she was hanging up dresses like this and reaching back and getting another dress and hanging it up. And reaching back and getting another dress and hanging it up. And her hands are the ugliest hands I'd ever seen in my life. Bleeding all over and split and gross, ugly, gross all over. She's reaching, been on there for years. And she's reaching like this, hanging up dresses. And she hung up a dress and reached down like this to get another dress. And she went, ow! <laughs> she come running down the hallway, sound like a dresser or something turned over in her room. She run against the wall. <laughs> I tell you, when God shows up, he might run against the wall. <laughs> Especially if you've been serving a God that you don't know if he's a miracle working God or not. And you've just been going to church, you know, and singing songs and being nice. 
When God comes and performs a miracle for you, you go, ow! It's a skill. That's what she did. She ran against the wall, ran down the hallway, holding her hands out like this, said, Daddy, Daddy, this scares me. This is spooky, Daddy. Spooky. She scares me. Ow, ow, scares me. Look at my hands. Look at me, Daddy. Look at my body. Look at my body. I have a new body. I have new hands. Look at me, Daddy. All over my legs. Look at me. Look at me, Daddy. Look at me. I got new skin. Look at me. going to happen in the when because the Lord told me in heaven it happened. The Lord told me in heaven. He told me what happened if I'd believe it, not doubt. And I refuse to doubt. I mean, I refuse to doubt. Now, I'm going to tell you the real truth about the gospel, whether you like it or whether you don't like it, that's up to you. But anything that God has promised you that you have not received is because, because of your dumb doubting. Amen. When I say dumb, I mean dumb. Because... <laughs> Doubting in the eyes of God is just plain stupid. Did you ever stop and think it takes just as much effort to doubt God as it does to believe God? Why don't we human beings turn our faith loose on what God says, turn our mouth loose on what God says, and just step out boldly, just step out ruthlessly and, and, and trust Him and believe Him? I don't care what He says, believe it. I know one time God told me He was a crippled man, come down in front of the wheelchair and I taught that night in Canada on you can have confession brings possession. I mean, you know, you have to understand, my brother and sister, that God spoke the world into existence. And, and, and your whole life is controlled by your tongue. It doesn't make any difference what I get from God. That's no sign you'll ever get it. It doesn't make any difference what you receive from God or what you receive from God. You can receive everything in the Bible from God. But that's no sign your neighbor will ever get it. But if you'll make up your mind to zero in on God's Word and believe exactly what you read, and I mean take it away from the devil and from your relatives and from your friends that says, well, I don't know about this stuff, you know. I mean, this stuff, you know, dear God, you mean you, you believe God for new hands? Yes, you believe God for new hands. If you believe God for new hands, will you get new hands? Only if you refuse to doubt. You have to come to a place in your life that you totally refuse to doubt anything that God says. Yet, the more ruthless you are, the better God likes it. The stronger you are, the more ruthless you are about it, the more miracles that God will perform for you. And He performs the miracles so easy, and they come so easy, and so come so quick. As quick as you can bat your eye. Just as quick as you bat your eye. One moment, my daughter had a ugly hands and ugly arms and ugly legs. The next moment, she had brand new hands, the prettiest hands in high school. New legs, everything had been removed off of her. All the gross, every one of them. Besides that, new skin had been put up on her. Whoosh. As quick as you can. That's the reason, that's the reason that I'm, I'm, I'm wild like I am. You stand in your own house and see God come and do something like that, you know, you never get over it. I mean, you know, it'll last you a lifetime. You don't need about two or three of those. I mean, you don't need to see one every day. I mean, you, 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 just, you, you see one or two of them and it, it'll last you for a lifetime. You'll either get turned on to God or you're just as flaky as they come. <laughs> if you can't believe God for a miracle after that, I mean, I don't know what you what it could ever do. Give your own child new hands and new skin upon her. God is the miracle working God, my brother and sister. This is a scripture he used with me when he took me to heaven that time and talked to me about my daughter and performing a miracle for her. Now, I want you to listen to this. You might say, Brother Noble, I have a deformed child. Well, God will make it normal. Really? I've been going to church for 15 years and it's not made normal. No, that's not the way you, make it, you get a deformed child made normal. That's not the way you get it made normal. <laughs> Uh, you have to show God. You have to seek God for the truth, my brother and sister. And you have to never doubt. And you have to go around talking like you mean it. I, I know a woman that drug a deformed child across the floor for three years. Drug a deformed... Every day she dragged a deformed child, the, the deformed child across the floor and say, in Jesus' name, I command you be normal. In Jesus' name, I command you be normal. I'm not giving you any choice. You can't stay like that. See, if you give that crooked leg a choice, It'll stay crooked. And by 
by you being silent, you give it a choice. It'll never obey you. You being silent concerning that blind eye, it'll never open. No, it won't. It'll never open. This blind Bartimaeus sitting by the highway side begging, if he ever did what he did with his mouth and confessed what he did, he would have died blind. You have to, you have to know what causes Jesus to perform miracles. If you don't know what causes Jesus to perform miracles, then you're not going to get any. You just have to live out the natural aspect of it, whatever it may be, and just suffer and live in God's permissive will in some phase of God's permissive will. But if you listen to what the Lord Jesus Christ says and know that your tongue controls everything about your life, your tongue to your life is like a steering wheel on a car. The way you turn the steering wheel, that's the way the car goes. What you confess, what you believe, what you make Jesus in your own mind and with your own tongue, that's the kind of Jesus he is to you. And if he's not the kind of Jesus he is to you that's in the New Testament, then you're in the wrong, my brother and sister. You're not scriptural or you're doubting God. Some of us says, uh, well, I believe the Lord. I believe the Lord and, and, uh, and you know, and uh, Brother Norval and, uh, and, and I believe the Bible and I believe the Lord and it, it didn't work. I said, I know you didn't do it. That's an abomination against God, you old flaky thing. You quit saying that. <laughs> well, I had a woman stopped me in a convention in Indianapolis, Indiana, Indiana. I was teaching in the afternoon before Gospel Business Business Convention, the Indiana Convention. And I come off the platform, and boy, I mean, she stopped me. She is fit to be tied after she heard me teach. She's a real sharp lady, about 38 years old, looks like. And boy, when I come off the platform, she stopped me in the lobby. She said to me boldly, she said, Mr. Hayes, I don't believe what you teach. Boldly. I mean, that's what she said, getting bold about it. Well, I've never had somebody stop and tell me that because I try to stick to the Scriptures closely, and that's what she told me. I said, well, what, uh, I said, you mean you don't believe the Bible? She says, huh, oh, sure I believe the Bible. I said, you mean I taught something that wasn't in the Bible? If my, my sister, if you will tell me anything I've taught today that's not in the Bible, first of all, I'll repent to God, and then I'll repent to you for leading me astray. Now tell me what I've taught this afternoon that's not in the Bible. Well, she said, I don't know. I don't know about that now. But she said, what you teach don't work. Oh, I said, you mean the Bible don't work? She says, no, I didn't say that now. <laughs> See, the devil's crazy. <laughs> he's, totally, he's totally nuts. Just totally nuts. Well, she says, my husband, I just said it don't work. My husband... My husband died at 41 with cancer, and, and he believed that, he, that the Lord was going to heal him right until he took his last breath. And I believed it, and our neighbors believed it, and we had thousands of Christians praying, and they believed it, and he died. Well, I said, as long as you believe that the Lord is going to heal you, you always die. The Lord's not going to do anything. He's already done it. You have to accept it on a faith basis. Faith basis. You have to accept all the Bible on, the, uh, on a faith basis. And she said, uh, what do you mean? And the Lord, I mean, brother, he shot a scripture in me so fast to give her because she is mad at me. I mean, she was fit to be tried. She was mad at me. I don't mean just a little bit. I mean, she was angry because her husband had died at the age of 41 with cancer. And there she was. He hadn't been dead very long. And there she was, a sharp lady, about 37 or 38 years old, left without a husband, and they prayed, I mean, they prayed, and she said they prayed, and they prayed, and every friend they had believed, and every pastor they had, and every full gospel pastor they had believed, and they believed, and they believed, and they believed, and they believed, and, it just, and he died, and so it, it just, I just know it don't work for everybody. I said, you mean to tell me the Bible don't work for everybody? You mean God wrote the Bible for some people, but didn't write it for your husband? Well, Mr. Hayes, I'm telling you that I was there, and I was there, and it didn't work. And... <laughs> The Lord said to me, this is plainly, told me to share it with her. He said, he never did, he never did talk to the cancer. And I said, is that right? <laughs> I said, lady, let me ask you a question. Did you, ever hear, did you ever hear your husband hold a conversation with the cancer? She said, what? I said, did you ever hear your husband hold a conversation with the cancer? She says, what?
When you say what like that two or three times, that means you don't know anything. He said, what? I said, did you ever? So I read in the scripture. Whosoever shall stand under this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea. I said, read that. So I got her read it. She opened up her Bible and she read it. Whosoever shall stand under this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea. I said, see there? See, there it is. She said, there's what? I said, there's your answer. She said, I don't see no answer. I said, read it again. I had to read it over several times. She finally, after a while, after I had to read it about five or six times, Finally, she broke and started crying. I said, you didn't know that your husband disobeyed the Lord Jesus Christ, did you? You thought he was the best Christian in town. And it cost him his life because he disobeyed the Lord Jesus Christ. Get this straight, America. It'll cost you your life, too. You disobey the Lord Jesus Christ, it'll cost you. God won't do anything for you. God won't heal you, and God will not perform a miracle for you. You start disobeying Him. You don't have to find out for yourself. God says, I have sent my word to heal you. I've sent my word and my spirit to perform miracles for you. And He'll do anything for you. But you have to know how to get Jesus to do it. Last night's message to you, worshiping Him continually, on a continuous basis, that doesn't mean every minute of the day, that means continually. It'll cause him, that way you'll find more favor with God than anything you've ever done in your life. When you spend time worshiping God, you'll find more favor with God. If you spend time worshiping Jesus, you'll find more favor with God than you ever dreamed that you'd ever find with God. God has to find favor in what you're doing, what you're saying, how you believe. You can't believe the Bible in a way you want to. You can't believe faith in a way you want to. You think, well, because it happened to my relative and they were a good Christian, it just was not God's will. Look, the Bible is God's will. You can't judge, it's not fair for you to judge God and judge the gospel, but, why, but something happened to one of your relatives. That's not fair. It's not fair to God, it's not fair to Jesus, it's not fair to the Holy Spirit, it's not fa fair to the Word of God for you to judge God by what, happen, by, by what happens to one of your friends or one of your relatives. And I'm sure there's people out there that's got deformed children and Children like mine was, you know, with knots and gross all over them in all kinds of shapes because this satellite tonight is going to over 700 churches across America. And, uh, but I know a lady that took a deformed child. You said, well, do you, ever see, do you ever see God make very many deformed children normal? No, you don't hardly ever see him do it. Why? Well, because God does what you do. God responds to you according to your faith. God don't respond to you according to my faith. God don't respond to you according to Moses' faith. He responds to you according to your faith. If you need a miracle from God, you can get one. This lady, she just drugged the form child across the floor every day, every day, and said, I command you in Jesus' name to be normal. I command you in Jesus' name to be normal. Then she'd drag him a little bit further. I command you in Jesus' name to be normal. And she did that every day for three years. One night she went to bed, heard a noise in the other room, got up and looked, and he was normal. God, God come and got in the bed with him and made him normal. Oh, yeah. Well, do you think that might happen to my child? Probably not. No, I don't think it happened to your child. Uh-uh. I don't think it'll ever happen to your child. Not until you get your thinking straightened out. And most people don't have their thinking straightened out according to the teaching of God's Word. They refuse to talk to mountains. They refuse to talk to diseases. They refuse to talk to deformed children. They don't talk to crooked legs. They don't talk to blind eyes. They don't talk to that... that that thing that's buffeted you for years, that's a mountain in your life, why don't you talk to that dumb thing and make it stop? Talk to it. Talk to it. In Jesus' name, talk to it. Jesus told me, he said, you better talk to them. Tell them what you mean, because they will spread, and you'll have, she'll have more than 42 gross. She'll have lots of gross. You better talk to them and tell them they can't stay on your daughter's body. 
You better talk to them. You better curse them in my name. You better believe and not doubt. And boy, I refuse to doubt. I mean, I refuse to doubt. I would not doubt. I would not doubt. I refuse to doubt. And I'm telling you from experience, it don't make no difference if your child is deformed, if it's got growths all over it, if it's got blind eyes. I am telling you boldly from experience that God will come to your house and go in the room where your child is at and make it normal and put new skin upon the child. You say, do you think so? No, I don't think so. I know so. It happened to my child in my house. I know that Jesus will do it. I know that Jesus wants to do it. And the only reason he ever told me that was because I sought the Lord for the truth. I saw that my prayers weren't working. He would probably let me pray until my teeth fell out. I'd been praying for years and nothing happened. In fact, the longer I prayed, the bigger the gross got. The longer I prayed, the worse she got. The longer I prayed, the uglier she got. But I began to seek God for the truth. I don't want this God in my house. I don't want this in my daughter. I don't want it. I want to know the truth. I, you do it in the Bible, Jesus. You do it in the Bible. I don't know why you don't do it in the First Baptist Church. Do you, does he do it in the First Baptist Church where you went, Brother Normal? No, are you kidding? He don't, he don't even do it in your church unless you believe it. I mean, you have to stand up boldly and recognize the Lord Jesus Christ as a miracle worker. You have to open up your mouth without shame. And you have to call him a miracle worker. Many people don't understand why, how I could go around the country teaching the Word of God like I do. And in my ministry, I have never made a salary. I don't need a salary. Are you kidding? I own 11 businesses. What do I need a salary for? I give my money to the gospel. I didn't come to Fort Worth, Texas, and I'm not speaking to 700 churches for my benefit. I already know what I'm going to say. I came for your benefit. You understand that? Whatever money Bob gives me, I can use for the gospel. I don't need to make a salary for my ministry. Never have made a salary. Don't want a salary because I don't eat much anyway. But when the Lord began to come to me and call me and begin to unfold the Bible to me and set me in the office of the teacher. Now, tomorrow night, I told you before, and if you listen to me, you can see great things happen tomorrow night. You'll see them happen tonight, but tomorrow night, you're going to see something supernatural happen. But if you don't believe what I'm telling you, you just nonchalant and say, oh, well, oh, well, you know, oh, well, oh, well. And you stay home, oh, well, you won't see anything. God don't perform miracles while you're watching gun smoke. <laughs> but I'm just telling you that the Lord called me to teach the Bible and set me in the office of the teacher. He said, son, I want you to teach the church how the Word of God works. You teach. You teach. And he unfolds it to me. Larry and Vicar tried with me for nearly a year. They know that the Holy Spirit un works, works all the time. I mean all the time, not part of the time. He works all the time continually, and he'll work tonight. See, the bolder, the bolder you get about it, the more of God's power you get. If you don't ever tell a blind man, say, Look, Jesus will give you new eyes, mister. Do you understand that? If you, if you just say, Well, I'll pray, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> there ain't no use in you praying to see what I already know what's going to happen. What? Nothing. Usually nothing. You got to be no. You got to do more sometimes than just pray. I prayed for three years for my daughter. She received nothing. In fact, it got worse. But when God told me what to do and boldly talk to it and talk to that mountain, talk to that mountain, talk to that mountain, talk to it, talk to it, run it off, curse it in my name, tell it to die, get out, go. Anything that you have tonight that's buffeting you, a crooked leg, a blind eye. A bad kidney. Anything that's wrong with you tonight that you need a healing or you need a special miracle from God. The day that you get tired of having that thing and you come against that thing in Jesus' name and say, in Jesus' name, stop! And you begin to claim your rights in Christ Jesus, you're on your way right then to get a miracle from God. But as long as you just kind of float around and go to church 
and sing songs and be nice and just waiting on God to give it to you. I'm believing the Lord to give it to me in His own time. Well, I can tell you when His own time is if you're going to believe like that. Never. 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 That's not even the way to believe God. How do you get Jesus to perform miracles? You obey God. You obey the Word of God, first of all. Notice now Matthew 21, 21. If you haven't found it yet, forget it. You'll never find it. <laughs> I bet you thought I'd forgot it. I don't usually ever forget anything. Sometimes I do. Not often, no. The Spirit of God lives in you. You know, He can quicken your memory. Blessed be God forever. Matthew 21, 21. Notice what Jesus said. Let us be cursed the fig tree that died. This is what He gave me in heaven. Verily I say unto you, if you have faith and doubt not. Notice these words now. It's strong coming straight from Jesus to you. Verily I say unto you. Everybody say, Jesus, Jesus. Is, talking to me. is talking to me. Well, I know that people understand that He is talking to you personally. Get yourself out of the gutter, Christian. Quit living beneath your means and what's been provided for you. And quit st stop allowing your mind to think, oh, well, you know, maybe the Lord would do it for me. You know, He would do it. I know He will do it for you. Rise up in Jesus' name and take it away from the devil. Rise up. Blessed be God forever. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, if you have faith and doubt not. Look at me, congregation. That across America, look at me. Do you have faith to believe God for anything He says? Yes. If you do, you can receive. If you don't have it, then why don't you get it? Faith cometh to you by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. He says right here, Verily I say unto you, if you have faith. Now notice that Jesus didn't say you had faith. He didn't say that. There's one thing about Jesus. He's not a liar. He said, if you have faith. And doubt not. You shall not only do this, which was done to the fig tree, but if you shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. Now, most of you are not ready for verse 22, but you're going to get it anyway. <laughs> Notice what Jesus says. I mean, after this, you'll wonder if you're even saved or not. He says, the first three words Jesus said, And all things. That includes my daughter Zona. This ghost on her. That includes your deformed child. That includes your broke business. That includes your crooked leg. That includes that part of the body that you need to have fix it. If that don't include everything, when Jesus says all things, if that don't include you, then I can't read. I don't even understand the Bible if it don't include you. I am telling you boldly, my brother and sister, in this auditorium in Dallas, Texas, and all the way across America, Jesus means you. Right here in verse 22. Notice what he says. And all things. Notice the S on it. He said, son, you better show them the S. Because if you don't show them the S, they'll think that their case is too hard. Or they, or they will think that it's not my will for their case. He says their head, their mind tells them that, which is unscriptural for them. This is their mind. It's not scriptural. I will do anything for them if they can believe it and not doubt. And all things, whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. Now, always remember this as long as you live on earth. If you didn't receive or anybody else, you did not believe. For you to go around in, in the face of God, after he tells you this, you go around on earth in the face of God saying, Oh, well, I believe, and, and, and I didn't get it. That's a lie from hell. You didn't believe, or you couldn't believe. You think Jesus is a liar? Jesus said right here, Believing, you shall ask in prayer, believing, he said, you shall receive. There's no conditions to that. Now listen closely, my brother and sister. If you ever put conditions on faith, 
you're whipped. I'm talking about something that God promises you boldly. Promises you in the Bible. It's right for the years. Healing, baptism of the Holy Spirit, a miracle for your body, a miracle for your children, miracles for your business. It doesn't make a difference what kind of miracle you need. God's a miracle working God. He's always been a miracle working God, and that's the way it is. He's always been a faith God. He is a faith God. Always been, has been a faith God. Never will be any kind of a God except a faith God, and that's the way it is. Jesus has always been a healer, and he never has been anything except a, a healer for the sick, and he'll always be a healer for the sick. He's a savior for the lost and a healer for the sick, and he'll work miracles for you, any kind of miracles that you want. It's all a gift, my brother and sister. Please let me beg of you tonight, accept this on a gift basis that God's provided through the Lord Jesus Christ for the church on a gift basis. It's all a gift. Faith is a gift. The gift of faith is provided for you. Healing is a gift. The gifts of healing. The gift of the Spirit. And always remember, miracles, working of miracles is a gift to the church. It's totally a gift. I was speaking one night in Roy Stocksdale's church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Just teaching the Bible like this. And all of a sudden, a girl stood up at the congregation. She stood up. Four or five people stood around her. And I said, what's going on? They said, nothing normal. Nothing normal. I said, what's going on? And she says, uh, uh, this crippled girl sitting here just got up. I said, really? I said, have her come up here. So a little girl about 14 years old come out and is trimming like this and crying, walking down the aisle of the church. And some young boy, a high school boy, looked, looked, looked like he's about 15 or 16, walking without looking at her legs. He said, this is my crippled sister. I have to get in here, I'll tell you. This is my crippled sister. I take her everywhere. This is my crippled sister. And he's looking at her legs. This is my crippled sister. He said, I have to get out of the car tonight. This is my crippled sister. I have to go everywhere. This is my crippled sister. This is my crippled sister. And you look at her legs. So she's trembling and crying. And I said, come up here, little darling. And I said, tell him. I said, what happened to you, honey? She said, I, I don't know. She said, I was just sitting there. And you're teaching the Bible. I was just sitting there. And all of a sudden, something warm began to go through my crooked legs. And it goes through my body. And it turned from warm to kind of hot. And I felt power go in me. Hot power. Went through, went through my legs and my joints. And so when I felt that power, I just... I made an effort to stand up on my own. I just tried to push my arms on the side of the seat. And I started to push up like this. And when I did, I stood up. And I looked down, and I was totally normal. That's it. That's called a gift of healing. Operating and functioning as a gift to the body of Christ. Working of miracles, working of miracles, it's a gift. But you have to know it's a gift. And Jesus in the New Testament. Jesus himself. How many, I don't want to send these people away. They've walked for days. They've been here with me for three days and want me to heal. And I've healed every one of them because anybody that comes and stays with Jesus for three days and you don't eat any food and you want your healing that bad, well, forget it. I mean, he'll heal you. You might as well look for that. I've healed all of them, but I can't send them away. They'll faint in the way. Do you have any food? No, we only got four or five loaves of bread and two or three little fishes. Jesus said to the disciples, well, that's all right. That's okay. You give them to eat. And the disciples go, huh? <laughs> well, when you say that, when you talk like that to Jesus, he knows that your faith is not where it's supposed to be. So he says to the disciples, he tried, if you'll notice in the scripture, he tried to get the disciples to give them to eat. And they said, but Lord, we don't, well, but I told you we only have four or five loaves and triple little fishes. Any time that the Bible promises you anything, and you raise up, in the face of God and say, yeah, but I got news for you. You're not going to receive. You're not going to receive. That but condition, but condition, and but condition will cost you your health, cost you your life. It could cost you your business. It could cost you your children. It could, it could be real expensive just because you doubt God. Jesus said, give them to me. And he, they handed him the, the, the bread and the fishes. He turned around looked up to heaven. That's where all the help comes from, is heaven. He looked up to heaven and asked the blessing of God upon it and turned back around by faith. Turned back around by faith. The same kind of faith the woman had that drug the deformed child across the floor and broke it and began to give it to him. And broke it and began to give it to him. And broke it and began to give it to him. Fed 5,000 one time and 7,000 one time, plus the children and women took up 12 baskets full after they got through eating. That's what you call working of miracles. 
The bread is not there to feed 5,000. All of a sudden, it's there. It's there. In fact, that's what you call hundreds and hundreds of miracles, thousands of miracles. Every time you broke a piece through, a miracle from God. Every time you broke a piece through, a miracle from God. Isn't that really sweet to take a loaf of bread and feed 5,000 people? Look, then you still got bread. Just keep on. Just keep on. Just keep on. Just keep on. And just keep on. And keep on. Faith. But faith works for you. Having faith to do that is your problem. Letting doubt come in to trust God. That is your problem and my problem. We have to take, you better zero in on what the problem is. And get rid of all of your doubt. I thank you in the Bible. Have you been delivered from yourself yet? You have to be delivered from yourself to ever believe what God tells you and get God to perform miracles for you. I could not believe the way I believe and get God to perform a miracle for my daughter. I could not believe it. I had to be delivered from all of my church teaching and all of my faith teaching, be delivered totally and curse those things in his name and says, No, gross, you can't stay in my house with my daughter. You dummies, get out of my house. Get out of my daughter. Get out of my daughter's body. Get out, I said in Jesus' name. Get out. And you tell them to get out every day, every day, every day, every day.